questions wherever you are, welcome to the Must Read Alaska Show. Coming to you from somewhere in Alaska. This is the place where we talk about, you guessed it, Alaska. Where we keep the mainstream media on their toes and where we are standing up for what's right in a world run by leftists. You can find out more by heading over to mustreadalaska.com and also checking out the Must Read Alaska YouTube channel for some really great content. But first, let's get this party started. Welcome, everybody, to the Must Read Alaska Show. I'm your host, John Quick, coming to you live from somewhere in Alaska. I want to thank everybody that listens, watches, and reads Must Read Alaska. If you want to help keep the lights on, just go to mustreadalaska.com. On the right-hand side, there's a little donate button. Every $5, $10, $100 helps keep the lights on here at Must Read Alaska. If you want to sponsor the show, just email me, John, J-O-H-N, at mustreadalaska.com. Today, we have a doubleheader. If you didn't catch the first episode of today, I want to encourage you to go back and listen to the episode Chris Story from Homer was on. He wrote a new book called Millionaire Maker, talking about that he took that others can take in the real estate business to kind of launch your own future and maybe become a millionaire one of these days. But uh, we have another special guest today, Lieutenant Governor Nancy Dolstrom, here to talk about her campaign. She's running for Congress. Nancy, welcome to the Must Read Alaska show. Thank you, John. It's good to be back here with you again. Well, this will be exciting to hear kind of what spurred you on to run for Congress, what some of your thoughts, ideas, goals are, and what you do if you kind of got in day one. But first, tell us the story of what made you throw your name into the hat in the first place. Well, that's a good question. You know, the reason I decided to throw my name in the hat for this particular race is because I've been, like all of us, watching everything that's happening in D.C. and and in our state and being really highly concerned about what's been happening in D.C. I mean, I have kids and grandkids, and I want this con- country to be great and continue to be great for them. Um, I am just really unhappy with what's going on there, and I looked at the you know results that we had from our last uh, congressional election, and I'm not happy with how that turned out. And um, I said, you know what? I think I think that the things I stand for and believe in, a lot of people do, and I'm willing to serve, and I'm going to throw my name in the hat and let it be known that I am willing to serve Alaskans in that capacity. My kids are grown. Um, My husband is very supportive of me. I'm in a place where I could spend, you know, half a year, seven months, a year in in D.C. to do the job, and and I'm willing to do that. Um, I just think there's so many things on the line and we've got to get our country back. Amen to that. You know, one of the things that's I think important to a lot of Alaskans is energy, right? That pretty much makes up our whole economy. Most all of our jobs, it pays for government uh, types of services. What are your thoughts and ideas of kind of keeping Alaska energy uh, in abundance and kind of getting the federal government to stay away from over-regulating it? Well, you know, Alaska is an oil and gas state. We always have been and we always will. We have tons of oil and gas in the ground. Alaskans and companies need to have the ability to be able to drill and gain the permits that are necessary so that they can go after these products. Not only will Alaskans benefit, but the entire country benefits and it keeps us more secure. You know, if we don't have the oil and gas and the other minerals and things that are available in our state at with at the mines, if we don't have access to them, we become more dependent on other countries and specifically China. And honestly, that that scares the daylights out of me because they have nothing but ill will towards us. They don't have any any good use for us except to um, destroy us they wouldn't be happier couldn't be happier if they you know were able to destroy us and we need to not depend on them for anything um you know when i see different parts of our country being shut shut down and specifically you know alaska president biden has issued over 60 executive orders that have directly been towards the state of alaska in shutting down our resources and uh, you know, I, I jokingly in D.C. one time said, gosh, it's like he wants to shut our state down. Mm-hmm. And somebody who was serving in a federal capacity said, that's exactly what he wants. And I don't understand that thinking or that mindset of wanting us to be dependent on other countries. I don't understand it at all. But I know that it's not right. 
And I know that once we're, you know, really dependent on other countries, we're never going to be safe. Um, and, you know, speaking of being safe, one of the, I, I will tell you, one of the first things I will do in work with people in Washington, D.C. is I'm getting our borders closed. That also is a reason why I decided I need to jump in with the situation that we have with our open borders. Um, we are in a bad it's, it's bad. We have 10 plus million people in this country that we don't know where they are or what they're doing. Um, many of them we know are young fighting age. And I mean, that's horrific. That is horrific. And I will tell you, I had an opportunity, it's been almost three weeks now to go to Yuma, Arizona to the border. And I witnessed myself people coming across the border and into our great country. They were young children. There was a lot of young adults. Um, mostly males, but some females, hardly any, I, did, I don't think I saw any elderly people, you know, and everybody looked healthy. Um, it was pretty interesting to talk to the uh, officers there who explained to me that these folks are are flown into places like Cancun, and then they're put on air-conditioned buses by the cartel and driven very close to the border wall, and they get out, and then they walk that last little bit. And I said, well, that makes sense of why nobody looks like they're broke, uh, they've broken a sweat or their shoes aren't worn out. Everybody looks good, right? Because they, they paid a lot of money to these people that are abusing them and abusing the system, um, to get them here and they, um, they come here and then who knows, you know, what they do. But I want to tell you, John, that one of the most disturbing things I learned when I was at the border is there's 85,000 children who are unaccounted for in our country. Mm -hmm. And there's, this is 85,000 children who they know have crossed the border but we don't know where they are now. And I was asking the border patrol agents, how can this happen? What, what do you mean they come across alone? And he said, you'll have a group and there will be young children. No, no adults are you know, assigned to them. And they will literally have a note pinned on the back of their shirt that says, call so-and-so, or my grandma's this person and she's in this state, or my friends in another state, you know, call this person to come and get them. And our officers are obligated to call those people and we get that child to them. And then who knows what happens. And unfortunately in our, in our state and in our country, we know we have a huge trafficking problem, whether it's for sexual traffic, labor traffic, you know, uh, domestic um, servitude, whatever it is, it's wrong. It's illegal. And we know that it's, it's a horrendous problem. So, you know, when I heard about all those kids, it was just even all the more reason why we have got to get the borders closed. Until they're closed, we don't have national security. We just don't. We do not have any. And I honestly believe we've got to close the border and then we need to work on the immigration situation. Well, it's a problem. I mean, it's not a situation. It's a problem. We need to look at where are all those people and they need to go back to where they came from and come through legally. Now, I'm also going to tell you that I think that we could change our immigration process. I think we could make it a little bit easier and a little less time consuming for these folks. You know, when you hear stories of people that have waited seven, eight, nine, ten years to get here legally, I can understand why they're just so frustrated. But we need and we welcome people to come here you know, the legal way, but, but, you know, back to your original question that really played heavy into um, why I decided to throw my name in, you know, people here in Alaska, I hear it all the time. We're so far away. We're so lucky that we're not affected by this. We are affected by it. We have ask anybody in the medical field, how many people they are treating that have no identification, People that are in the hospital delivering babies or having services that can't speak the language have no identification. The medical people will say they're undocumented folks. Um, and you know what? Even worse than that, a lot of them are bringing drugs into our country. And the fentanyl problem in this country is huge and out of control. Our state, as you know, had the highest increase in fentanyl deaths last year per capita. And that is totally unacceptable. You know, when I was watching 
these people come across the border, I watch the agents give them a pat down. Now, one of the positions that I held have held is as commissioner of department of corrections. And I know what a proper pat down is. And what I saw was not a proper pat down. It was more of a running your hand down their arm and down the outside of their leg to the knee. And then they were done. I watched this and I thought they've got drugs in all kinds of places on their body and in their bodies. And that's making its way up here. You know, law enforcement, whether it's a federal or our state troopers or local police departments all say that when they make these big busts, they can trace that fentanyl and those heavy drugs back to someone that came across the border. And so, you know, that's going to affect all of us. Every, everybody is is being affected by this. And so, you know, like I said, I am willing to, and I, I love this state. This is my chosen home. I came here for a vacation and decided to stay and it's been 40 plus years. Um, so a long vacation. I, it, I know it was a little, my suitcase. I don't know where that suitcase is, but um, the clothes don't fit anymore. I had to get some new clothes. <laughs> You know, I have to share, there's another thing I learned that affects Alaskans too, that's going on at the border. And that is when people come across and they go into these fields where all the produce and everything is, and then they, if they lay down in it, or even if a dog or a cat goes and, and urinates on these, this produce, there's such a thing as a five foot no harvest law that the farmers have to destroy everything at their expense. They can't, you know, just dig it up and grind it back into the earth. And I would, that's what I would think you would do. And it would become natural fertilizer and stuff. They have to actually destroy it. And so all this produce and stuff that comes from these warm areas and feeds a lot of us in the United States is being affected by it. And the costs are gonna go up there's going to be shortages of things and the farmers and those people in that area are, you know, they're the ones that are bearing the, the cost of that. And there's no such thing as insurance for that type of thing. And these are also the same people that go to bed every night and put out water and snacks on their porches, hoping that when people come through in the night, that they'll just take that and move along and not break into their home, which is a huge problem, you know, in, yeah. in that area I learned. And so, you know, you can tell I'm pretty revved up about what I saw. I, I don't know how anybody could see that and, and not just know that we have got to make changes in our country. And that's something day one, we have to start working on is closing that border. I like that. Well, you know, you've had a pretty amazing career so far. You've were elected official and then you were commissioner of corrections under Dunleavy, now Lieutenant Governor. How do you think that's shaped kind of your experiences to then now uh, run for U.S. Congress? Well, you know, I every single position I've been blessed to be able to, to serve Alaskans in has just been incredible. I have not only learned so much, but every time you learn more and more ways that you can help people and make this a better state a better place and one of the things that i think is great is i love being able to show people how they can be part of the process get them excited to be part of the process and and let them know how critical you know it is that they do get involved i mean it's just you know for those of us that are really involved in this process you know we hear things like your vote is so critical we know this stuff but sometimes people don't feel as enthused as we do and it's it's fun to be able to, and it's satisfying too, to be able to explain to people how important their participation is. And um, what I hear a lot of times, whether it's from kids, but especially adults is, my, it just doesn't matter what I think, or, you know, my vote doesn't really matter, or I was busy, so I'm just not going to go. And I've explained different ways and different time, you know, look at this race where this person won by four votes or this person lost yeah. by seven votes or, you know, we had somebody a couple of years ago that won by one vote. One and they vote. Recounted, somebody won yeah. by one vote. <laughs> yeah. They recounted it three times and it came out the same in one, one vote. Can you imagine if you're in that district and your person is the one that lost and you didn't go vote? I just, you know, it's such a, it's a privilege that we have in this country to have a right to be able to elect our leaders and to be able to participate in the process. 
And I'm the first to acknowledge that sometimes it's frustrating. It can be really frustrating, um, but we have to stay involved. And I think that we have so many wonderful things in our state and in our country. Um, we we are at risk of losing some of these um, things that we value, I believe, because of things that have been happening in Washington, D.C. And we have, we've got to turn some things around now. Yeah, I agree with you there. So, um, you know, you've had some pretty stellar endorsements, I'm sure that they've been awesome to kind of see come through. Talk to me a little bit about what that means to you to get, you know, the Speaker of the House of the U.S. Congress to endorse you, the, my, the, the majority leader, things like that. Governor Dunleavy, what does it mean for folks like that to come through and endorse you? Well, I'll tell you what, it's so, uh, it, it can has almost been overwhelming, even at a few times, even thinking about these folks and, um, my respect for them and the sacrifices that they make for our state and our country. Um, I've, you know, I went into this race just knowing that I'm going to just put myself out there, what I am, who I am, and, and I want to serve, I'm willing to serve. And if, um, I'm, I'm hopeful that people will know that I am sincere and, uh, you know, it's, it's been best to just, it's just best for everyone to be themselves, right? And so as I've met with some of these great leaders, um, I've just gone in there and it's like, what you see is what you get. This is me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think some, it's the same with them too. I think that they they get put up on a pedestal a lot, but they're pretty normal people. And we all put our pants on in the morning the same way, right? And I always say, you know, we all look a little bit funny in the morning when we wake up. And so it's, it's um it, it's been truly an honor to talk with these folks and i think i've learned something from all of them i've appreciated their uh their encouragement and their enthusiasm and it's also been neat to learn how they started um one thing i've known noticed is that they're very open and sharing their experiences and um you know they ask me a, a lot of questions about my my background and different positions that i've held and um, lots of questions about being commissioner of department of corrections and, you know, stories and things that are there, because that's not some but thing that, you know, everybody um, has an opportunity to, to be involved in, but um, it, it's been, it's been incredible. And I, I want to live up to their expectations. That's awesome. So let's say it's, you know, uh, day one in office, you get elected. What are some of those first things you're going to do? you know, first day, first week, first month that are going to be top priority for you? Well, I'll tell you what, right after getting elected, um, one of the first things that usually happens in any political organization is that you caucus and you have committee assignments and there's leadership, um, you know, chosen and those types of things. And so, um, you know, there's several areas that are really critical to Alaska. I mean, obviously anything to do with military and veterans affairs, anything to do with resources, anything to do with transportation. Um, I'm I'm pretty interested also in the Ways and Means Committee, which I know it would be hard for a freshman to be on there. But, um, you know, anything that has to do with keeping us from being unnecessarily taxed is, I think, important. And so that's why that committee jumps out. But uh, I just look forward to, to serving and I look forward to being a conduit between Alaskans and people in DC and, you know, fighting, fighting for Alaska. Um, I, I personally am hopeful that we have an, a different president in November. And um, I'm, I'm hopeful that it's, it's president Trump. Um, but it, it's, it's critical no matter what, that we have the majority in the house and in the Senate and that way we can either all work together or we can stop bad legislation. And, you know, one of the things, John, that I learned serving in the Alaska legislature is sometimes the most important work that you do, it's not in creating new legislation, it's in stopping bad legislation mm -hmm. or removing unnecessary barriers and things that are on the books. And I think, you know, I think that that's important. I'm, I mean, I've watched Governor Dunleavy do it with, you know, removing regulations and things that just slow down the process and don't really in the end have a, a, a real need. And um, his whole reasoning for that is to make things easier for Alaskans. And 
I, I totally buy into that way of thinking. Um, I think following the law is important, but I think having, you know, laws that are meaningless is just a burden on everybody. And, and it puts a huge burden on public safety too, to try to enforce some of these things. So um, I, I think there's going to be lots of opportunities to stop bad legislation. And I think we're going to have a great group that um, is looking out for America's best interest. So um, how important is it for you, let's say you're in office, to take phone calls from both sides? Because I think, you know, Alaska gets one congressional seat, right? And so you have to represent all Alaskans. And I think that's one of the, probably the, one of the biggest pain points of our current uh, Congresswoman is, um, you know, conservatives feeling like she doesn't really care anything about them. And so how would you address this? You get elected, you're, you're conservative. Are you going to take phone calls from from everybody and, and be okay with that? Because right now we, you know, only one side of the aisles being heard in Alaska and conservatives kind of feel like left out a lot. I feel like. Well, I will tell you that the answer to that is yes, but I want you to also know that you could go and you could talk with any of the people that I've worked with in the past in the legislature or as commissioner in corrections, or even now as Lieutenant governor, um, my job as Lieutenant governor is I work for all the people alongside the governor, right? So it's we represent all Alaskans and we're here to serve all Alaskans. And um, I think that it's critical that we all look at each other as Alaskans first before we start dividing up and, you know, different parties and different groups. Um, I think it's very important for us to listen to people that we don't agree with. I think it's very important to do it with open ears and open hearts so that you can learn. Um, when I'm talking with somebody and sharing ideas and I know they might think different, I really value the fact that they give me enough respect to listen. And that is something that I try to always do back. And so my legislative office always took you know, calls and I took calls from people no matter what their, you know, party was and, or if they voted or didn't vote, you know, and um, sometimes that was a little bit frustrating, you know, but um, th the job in representing Alaskans is everybody. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. What So people are going to be listening and they're going to want to, you know, know how to find out more. Um, so give us all those details. Do you have a campaign website? Uh, is your campaign on social media? We'll put the, all that stuff in the podcast description, but if there's somebody driving, you can kind of shout it out and they can go take a look at it. Later. That sounds great. Well, they can reach me at Nancy for Um, and on social media, I'm at Nancy for Alaska and, um, or info at Nancy for Alaska.com. And I am welcome, welcoming any comments or any, um, you know, suggestions from folks. I'm open to that. And, you know, one thing I want to say, John, if I could have just a few more minutes, Alaska yeah. has, has ranked choice voting. And this has been a hard thing for a lot of Alaskans to learn this new set of rules that come with this situation. And I think it's critical that everybody remembers I mean, we might not like something or really, but it's the it's the law of the land right now and we need to follow the laws. So my request for people when they're in the ballot box, I want to earn their vote. I really want people to vote for me and I want them to vote for Nick Baggage, the other Republican number two. But if they happen to be Nick supporters, fine. I want them to vote for me, number two. And that is how we'll get a conservative in our, our congressional seat in Washington, D.C. And th that is my ask. And I say that everywhere that I talk and as many times as I can, because I think that uh, people are so confused by the rules of ranked choice voting and um, or maybe feel like just because they don't like it, they're not going to do it. But we want to win. We've got to play by the rules. Yeah, that's what I tell people, too, is like you do not use ranked choice voting as an excuse not to vote. You got to get out there and vote because whether we like it or not, it's the law of the land. And uh, this election season, you got to get out there and vote. So I appreciate your thoughts on that. Yeah. So 30 minutes has gone by in a flash here. Do you have any last minute thoughts before we head off? Wow, I can't believe it's been 30 minutes. <laughs> well, I just I just want to tell you that 
you know, first of all, thank you for this opportunity. But as a longtime Alaskan and somebody who loves Alaska, I um I want the opportunity to go to DC and represent all Alaskans in DC as our congressperson. I have faith in our country and faith in uh, the citizens that I know better things, better days are ahead for us. Um, we have got to get our borders closed. We have got to get our economy and inflation um, back in line. If the economy can grow and be healthy, that takes care of so many, so many other problems. There's just you know, immigration and those types of things will will we will handle, but the border has got to be closed first. You know, I again I welcome any questions and I thank you for this opportunity to talk with you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us. For folks that maybe just cut the tail end here, I would encourage you to go back and listen to the whole thing. Former Commissioner of Corrections, current Lieutenant Governor uh, Nancy is running for Congress, folks, and you're going to want to hear her thoughts and opinions about Alaska and, and maybe how to move Alaska in a more, and forward in a more positive direction. If you listen, watch, or read, must read Alaska, and you want to help keep the lights on, just go to mustrealaska.com. On the right hand side, there's a little donate button. Every five dollars, ten dollars, hundred dollars helps keep the lights on here at Must Read Alaska. If you want to sponsor the show, just email me, John J O H N at mustreadalaska.com. I hope everybody has a phenomenal rest of the week. Thank you so much for joining us. Until next time, I'm John Quick from somewhere in Alaska. Thanks, Lieutenant Governor, for joining us. Thank you.